Hello and welcome to Biotechnology Part 4. In Part 4 we're going to talk about some basics in genetic engineering and in this particular lecture we are going to talk about the use of restriction enzymes in cutting DNA and using those cuts to insert new genetic material into new cells. So we've already discussed restriction enzymes and how they work and what they do but now we're going to use those restriction enzymes as a tool to genetically engineer a new um, bacteria. Uh, we are also going to look um, uh, real quick at a few other processes that are used in genetic engineering as well. So in restriction enzymes, I'll, let me go back here, we'll cover uh, restriction enzymes. With restriction enzymes, we use them to cut the DNA. We saw that in part one of our biotechnology lecture. But now that we've cut that DNA and we, we added new genetic material to it, remember the sticky ends, and we were able to take genetic material from another cell, uh, uh, in the video we watched, they were talking about insulin. So we took a copy of the gene for insulin and on the either end of that gene, we added sticky ends that were complementary to sticky ends left behind by a restriction enzyme in a bacteriophage, um, I'm sorry, in a bacterial cells plasmid. We insert that new DNA into the plasmid and we allow the bacteria to transcribe and translate this new gene and new plasmid to give us new gene products. Now these gene products, the, this type of genetic engineering has been around for about 50 years. So we can use it to create different drugs that are used in hospitals. Uh, we can use it to create human specific proteins like insulin that is now human specific. And that way it is more exact and correct. We don't see rejection by the body for it. Um, of course, classes of proteins called enzymes hormone replacement therapy, different types of growth hormones and such, that's all produced using bacteria and genetic engineering. Receptors, ligands for um, uh, cellular processes, parts of viruses or bacterial for vaccines, such as the antigenic determinants to create vaccines. We can use this type of engineering to create proteins used in man manufacturing industry and, of course, in the medical field. Uh, for example, we can use this to produce um, acetone for use in nail polish removers, uh, to produce enzymes for uh, pest control. We can also use this for producing um, uh, uh, insulin, of course, was the very first one. That one is always the one that comes to mind. We can use it to for DNA production and cloning of DNA as well so that we can get lots of copies of DNA fragments so we can use it for genomic sequencing. We can also use it to look for the locations of genes. We can add probes. We can um, look, use it in GMO production and in creating DNA libraries. So these are all different tools and different things that we can use restriction enzymes and genetic engineering for. So in recombinant DNA technology, this is a field of biotechnology in which we genetically manipulate different bacteria. We use a restriction enzyme again to cut a plasmid, leaving the sticky ends, and we add complementary sticky ends to a piece of DNA that contains our gene of interest, whatever gene it is that we want to insert. Um, we then uh, put that plasmid and gene together and that creates a new recombinant plasmid. So here on the right, we have a picture. And when we use a, a um, plasmid to carry a new gene into a bacterial cell, that plasmid is referred to as a vector. This is also done with bacteriophages, which if you remember we've described a few, time, few times, bacteriophages are also vectors and they're actually used more often than plasmid vectors are, um, and they are viruses that attack bacteria. So in this plasmid vector I have this circular piece of DNA, and in our um, in our gene regulation lecture, we looked at something called the LAC operon. Now the LAC operon is located on plasmids. And in this particular vector, we have the LAC operon and in the LAC operon is the LAC Z gene. The LAC Z gene is one of the A, Z and Y genes that are found on the LAC operon. If I were to um, put a, this plasmid into a bacterial cell, and the bacterial cell transcribed it, right? So this is transcription and translated it to make a protein. Then when these bacteria grew on this agar plate down here, this is a process called blue white spot plating. Uh, when they grow on this agar down here, um, they're able to metabolize 
the gene, all right? They're able to metabolize lactose. That's what this lac operon does. And when they do, there's another, um, there's this media down here contains a reagent called Xgal. And if lactose fermentation occurs, then the colonies that, um, uh, that grow in the cells that contain an intact lac Z gene will be blue. So the colonies will grow in blue. But if I wanted to insert my gene into this plasmid vector, I would do so at an area within the lac Z gene. If I insert my new DNA, so this is my, do, my new DNA, I insert it in the middle of that lac Z gene, this means that my lac Z gene is no longer functional. If it's no longer functional, it will not produce the waste products that XGAL indicates and the colonies will grow white. So if I look on this plate and I have white colonies, I can aseptically remove the white colonies, grow them in their own agar plate or broth, and I now have a pure culture of bacteria that contain my gene of interest. This is how we can differentiate between the cells that took up our um, new plasmid and the cells that did not. So we look for those cells that have changed, that have mutated away from that normal fermentation because we know that we have inserted our gene into the middle of the lax Z gene so it no longer functions. Okay, our next tool is the tool for DNA sequencing. Um, this was originally uh, discovered by a guy who's a scientist whose last name was Sanger. So it's referred to as Sanger sequencing. And in this particular process, we have a couple of ingredients that are going to occur. So we have the DNA that we want to sequence. We put this into a tube and we add to this tube an RNA sequence. Now, if we heat up DNA, uh, DNA will be separated into two single strands and we use the properties of DNA replication in order to sequence it. So we add an RNA primer, which would normally be added by primase, but we design the primer to a specific sequence. We add the, the DNA primer. We add the template DNA, the DNA that we want to sequence. We add DNA polymerase because we need um, to synthesize new strands of DNA. We add the deoxynucleotides, A, T, C, and G. And we also add fluorescently labeled dideoxynucleotides. And only a very small amount of these, very, very little. And these will not be added all together. We'll have four different tubes. And in each of these tubes, one of them will have the A, one of them will have the T, one of them will have the C, the other one will have the G in terms of the dideoxynucleotides. And uh, what will happen is when dideoxynucleotides are base paired to the strand, it will interrupt synthesis. And so DNA polymerase 3 will begin synthesizing. You can see here's our template strand at the bottom and on the top in red is the primer strand. And as DNA synthesis is replicating and um, is um, uh, replicating the DNA, if it incorporates a dideoxynucleotide, it can't move forward. This will interrupt the um, uh, synthesis of that strand. This will be completed on the same DNA template in four different tubes with four different fluorescently labeled dideoxynucleotides. So you can see here in part two, this chain elongation step is used to kind of determine where the interruption will be for all of these different um, regions of DNA. This will then be run on um, gel electrophoresis, or in more modern days, we do this with a, what's called capillary electrophoresis, which is a modified form of gel electrophoresis. And when we look at the decreasing fragment size, this begins to tell us the actual sequence of the, the DNA. So where the T came in, we have um, T, we have A, T, C, G, A is the sequence of this particular um, uh, strand of DNA. I'm going to uh, show you this video here from Thermo Fisher Scientific, and they can, um, they're going to give you a, a nice uh, explanation of Sanger sequencing with capillary electrophoresis. Oh, hey, let's go back to the basics and explore the technology platform that has been regarded as the gold standard for many years. Yeah, you guessed it. I'm talking about Sanger sequencing by capillary electrophoresis.
Many might ask, why is it called Sanger Sequencing? Well, Sanger Sequencing is named after the inventor of this groundbreaking technology, Dr. Frederick Sanger, who I like to call Fred, who developed this method over 40 years ago in the mid-70s. So what are the basics of Sanger Sequencing? Let's take a look at our lab book. It all starts by having a short primer binding next to the region of interest. In the presence of the four nucleotides, the polymerase will extend the primer by adding on the complementary nucleotide from the template DNA strand. To find the exact composition of the DNA sequence, we need to bring this reaction to a defined stop that allows us to identify the base at the very end of this particular DNA fragment. Sanger did this by removing an oxygen atom from the ribonucleotide. Such a nucleotide is called a dideoxide nucleotide. This is analogous of throwing a wrench into a gear. The polymerase enzyme can no longer add normal nucleotides into this DNA chain. The extension is stopped and we now need to identify what it is. We identify the chain terminating nucleotide by a specific fluorescent dye, four specific colors to be exact. Sanger sequencing results in the formation of extension products of various lengths terminated with dideoxide nucleotides at the 3' end. The extension products are then separated by capillary electrophoresis, or CE. The molecules are injected by an electrical current into a long glass capillary filled with a gel polymer. And during CE, an electrical field is applied so that the negatively charged DNA fragments move toward the positive electrode. The speed at which the DNA fragment migrates through the medium is inversely proportional to its molecular weight. This process can separate the extension products by size at a resolution of one base. A laser then excites the dye labeled DNA fragments as they pass through a tiny window at the end of the capillary. And the excited dye emits a light at a characteristic wavelength that is detected by a light sensor. Software can then interpret the detected signal and translate it into a base call. When the sequencing reaction is performed, in the presence of all four terminated nucleotides, you eventually get a pool of DNA fragments that are measured and separated base by base. What you will get in the end is a data file showing the sequence of the DNA in a colorful electropharogram and a text file which you can use to answer the questions you may be asking. And that, in a nutshell, is Sanger Sequencing. For more information, download the free DNA sequencing guide through the link below. I hope this video was helpful on the basics of Sanger sequencing, and I'm sure you'll have more questions. So submit your questions at thermofisher.com forward slash ask, and subscribe to our channel to see more videos like this. And remember, when in doubt, just seek it out. So that, like she said, in a nutshell, is Sanger sequencing. We're using that tool of electrophoresis that we studied in the first lecture, and we are using electrophoresis to separate these DNA strands based on size, and the size of the DNA strand is dependent upon where the dideoxynucleotides were added. So by separating by fragment size, we can uh, then determine the actual sequence of the DNA. So in our next lecture, we're going to look at how we can copy DNA, and this is a process known as PCR, or polymerase chain reaction. See you in the next one.